lot of us have a glut of tomatoes at this time of year, particularly in this glorious weather. And we want to preserve them, but not everyone has a pressure canner. Well, today we're going to cover how to bottle a can your excess tomatoes without needing a pressure canner. Hello, welcome to English Country Life. Welcome to the garden on a glorious summer's day. My name is Hugh and today I want to go through step by step how to produce bottled or canned, if you're American, tomatoes for yourself from your own excess stock. I use the word bottled because that's what we call it in England. Well, my granny used to bottle tomatoes, that's what we always used to call it. Americans refer to canning, and I think part of that dates back to you used to be able to buy proper machines for home use to make metal cans. You know, real, actual, what we'd call tins in the UK. You used to be able to do all that at home. The machines and the materials to use them are far less widely available now. They've kind of been consigned to history a little bit, but I think the term stuck. It doesn't really matter. What we all tend to use is some form of glass jar and some form of special lid. I'm going to go through that process step by step to make the bottled tomatoes. But what I also want to talk about briefly first are three things. I want to talk about the kinds of foods that it's safe to can or bottle without using a pressure canner. I want to talk about the kinds of jars it's safe to use. And I want to talk about if you're going to grow tomatoes specifically to preserve them, what the best kinds are to preserve. It won't take long. We'll whip through those quickly and then we'll cover the technique. I don't propose today to deliver some sort of detailed thoughts on all the different mechanisms of food preserving, but I do just want to touch on it just to explain that why what we're doing is safe. And I'd like you to imagine that there are basically two kinds of food that we may seek to preserve. There are foods that have something in them that is antibacterial and therefore will preserve themselves if put in a jar in the right way. And there are foods that haven't got that. Let me give you an example. This is a jar of jam. And in that jar of jam is a lot of sugar. And the presence of that sugar helps to preserve the content of the fruit that's in that jar of jam. This is a jar of pickled cucumbers. And the acid in the vinegar is the preserving agent. So there is stuff in that jar that's acting to preserve the contents. This is a jar of beef chili and there is no acid in there. There is no sugar in there. And if I put that in a normal jar, there's a very real risk that bacterial action could cause some really nasty stuff in this. There's one particular microorganism called botulinum that really can cause enormous health issues and even death. And it likes jars because it likes an area where there isn't oxygen. So we have to kill that and its spores and everything else off in order to ensure the contents of that jar are safe. And unfortunately, 100 degrees centigrade, the boiling point of water won't do that. It has to get hotter than that. And that's why we use a pressure canner because we're actually preserving with steam and superheated steam gets much hotter than the boiling point of water. And if you keep this stuff in there long enough, that heat penetrates all the way through the food, kills off any of those bad bacteria. The jar then seals, preventing new bacteria getting in and the content of that jar have been pasteurized and that's how it works and are held in a safe way. So we've got to consider whether the food we're preserving is the type where the contents itself are doing the preserving or pasteurization is doing the preserving. And interestingly, tomatoes are right on the limit of whether they're acid enough to preserve themselves. But if we up that acidity a little bit with some lemon juice, put a little bit of salt in there, we can be absolutely confident that these will preserve safely without pasteurization. And that's what we're doing today. I wanna to talk to you very quickly about types of jars and what they're suitable for. In the UK, these get used a lot. It's what I'm gonna call a jam jar, screw top jar with an integral metal and plastic lid. I buy new lids for them each time. I use them, they're commonly available. I use a 63 millimeter lid size and that fits a great deal of the jars that you will get from the supermarket. This is what I'm gonna call a mason jar. 
It's made by Kilner, and you'll hear the words Kilner jar used a lot, but I find Kilner jar an unhelpful term because that's made by Kilner, and so is that, and they're different types of jar. So mason jar, glass jar, comes with a metal screw-on band that has no centre, and each time you use it, you have a single-use flat lid, known as flats or lids, and that's held in place by the band during the processing. This is what I would call a clip-top jar. It has a glass jar, a glass lid, a rubber seal, and the lid and seal are held in place by spring-loaded metal. Jam jars used in the UK without water bath processing for jams, jellies, but also pickles, chutneys, that kind of food, been used that way for generations and completely safe. I know in the US generally jams and pickles and things like that are water bath processed. We don't in the UK and honestly, in my opinion, it's fine provided your other processes are safe. Mason jar, pretty much suitable for all types of food preserving, certainly suitable for water bath canning, certainly suitable for pressure canning. Interestingly, so are clip top jars. You can water bath can a clip top jar, you can pressure can. A clip top jar. There's a company called Le Parfait who make good quality clip top jars. I'll put a link in the description below and they give instructions for both of those techniques. And if you'd like to see water bath canning or pressure canning using clip top jars, let me know in the comments and I'll do a video on that. I'm happy to show you how to do it. But for today, because I've got them, I'm going to be using mason jars. And I'm going to be using the one litre size because generally when I want to cook with tomatoes, I want a lot of tomatoes. So briefly, that's types of food and types of jars that we've covered. Now what I want to say next is, if you want to preserve tomatoes in this way, you don't need fancy kit. You'll see me use various bits of equipment, but you don't need anything beyond a really big saucepan and some suitable jars. That's all you need to get this done. If you're going to buy yourself one thing though, buy this. Buy the Bull's Complete Book of Home Preserving. It has hundreds of safe recipes and techniques in it and it even describes in detail the processes of water bath canning and pressure canning. It is the most comprehensive guide to bottling, jarring, canning food that I've ever come across and I refer to it all the time. It's on my must-have list of books. I'll put a link to it in the description below in our Amazon shop. Really well worth having. It doesn't cover everything because it doesn't cover things like clip top jars, but we can cover those separately. But if you're going to use mason jars, that is the book to have. The first thing that we're going to have to do, of course, is to pick our tomatoes. And we're growing tomatoes in two places this year. One place is our 8x12 greenhouse, and we can get about a dozen plants in there, something like that. But last year we got blight, so we wanted to spread our risk and have tomatoes in two places. So this year, our secondary location is a six by three meter polytunnel that we bought mainly to net over for avian influenza. But we can grow tomatoes in it too. And we can get about 20 plants in the polytunnel, which gives us a decent amount of ripe tomatoes at a time and honestly when preserving it is really very nice to have enough of a glut of a product to preserve a decent amount in one run i like to remove the skins from tomatoes if i'm preserving them in order to be able to cook them later i find it actually just improves the taste what i do is cut across in the top and then i put the tomatoes into a pan of fiercely boiling water Keep them in there just for sort of 60 seconds or so and then I use a slotted spoon to remove them from the hot water and put them into some very cold or even ice water just until they're cold enough to handle because you don't want to burn your hands on the next bit. Then I find the skins will just slip cleanly off the tomatoes down to that scar of the stem and I will use the point of a very sharp knife carefully to remove that scar and the pith underneath it because it never cooks well. Before I start canning, I always check the recipe and I make sure that I've got to hand all the tools and all the ingredients that I'm going to need because there's nothing worse than getting halfway through and panicking. 
The next step then is to put all the jars in a very large saucepan, completely submerge them with near boiling water, a sort of gentle simmer. I think they suggest about 85 centigrade, but honestly, as long as it's actively steaming but not bubbling, that's fine. And the other thing I'm going to do is take all my lids, put them in a small saucepan of hot water and about the same kind of temperature. And I'm going to keep them at that temperature for 10 minutes so they're ready to use. Let's get bottling then. We take out our jars one at a time and fill each jar before removing the next. You'll see our jars look chalky because we've got very hard water, but we'll deal with that a bit later in the process. First thing, I'm going to put two tablespoons of lemon juice into the jar to raise the acidity and that'll be sufficient to protect our food. That's the right amount for a litre jar, you need a different amount for a 500ml. I'm choosing to also add a level teaspoon of salt. You can omit that if you're on a low sodium diet, I think it adds to preserving and flavour. And then I put the tomatoes in. You do have to be a bit careful, although you can go sort of quite quickly at the beginning, as you get towards the end, you have to work them into all the little gaps and you want to fill them right up to the shoulders and even a little bit above of the jar to get as many in as possible. When you've done that, you want to fill the jar with boiling water to half an inch from the top of the jar. I find personally that's a little bit hard to judge and someone advised me to get one of these gauges and each little notch is quarter of an inch and it's really helpful to check your levels. What I'll do then is take a non-metallic spatula and ease out any air bubbles that are trapped in and under the tomatoes. That really improves them. Then I'm going to wipe the neck and the threads of the jar because it's very important that that lid can adhere properly. Normally I use a canning funnel which helps, but with tomatoes I find it better to get my fingers into the jar. Once I've done that, I'm going to use a pair of tongs to remove one of the lids from the hot water. Just again, do these one at a time, don't rush it. The lid is flat and will sit cleanly and neatly on the neck of the jar. You'll notice there's a flex to it. We'll come back to that later. Once it's in place, I'm going to use one of the bands to lock that lid on top of the jar. Tighten it down to your fill resistance and just then fingertip tight. Don't make the mistakes that I did at the beginning of over tightening them. Just fingertip. The next step then is to actually process the jars and we're going to need a big saucepan of boiling water. But before I put the jars in, I'm going to use a little trick that someone told me about that really helps. And that's to put a good square of vinegar in the water and that will dissolve all that chalky material from the outside of the jar. Obviously the acidity of the lemon juice etc will also take care of any of it that's on the inside of the jar. The next step then is to lower the jars in the water and I'm showing you two methods here. This is a canning rack. You don't need one when you set out, but you don't want the jars rattling around and in close contact with the base of the pan. So if you haven't got a canning rack, just put a folded tea towel into the base of the rack. And as you can see, they are convenient because I can pick up all the jars and just lower them into the pan by the handles that are longer than the jars are high. Once the jars are in, you need to make sure that they've got a good covering of water. You want at least an inch of water above the top of the jar and you will probably have to put the heat back on for a while because obviously the jars are not as hot as the water and you need that water to be boiling properly. So get it back up to full boil. And then for a litre jar, you want to put 45 minutes on your timer, 40 minutes for a pint jar. And after that time, you've processed your jars. You can turn off the heat and you can remove them from the water. You can see me using oven gloves on the canning rack here, but let me show you the other method. These are jar tongs and they're brilliant. You can lift and lower jars into and out of any kind of canner without risk of scalding your fingers. They really are very useful and very cheap bit of kit. I'll put a link in the description. Once that's done, once you've got your jars out using whatever method, put them on somewhere to cool. And I usually use an old breadboard or something like that, because if you've got wooden work surfaces as we have, hot jars are going to mark the work surface. And what you really want to happen at this stage is the jar to cool comfortably and the lid to seal. And what happens is in the canner, lots of steam escapes. And then as the jar cools, it sucks that lid down and seals it. So once it's cooled a little bit, I tend to put a label 
on the jar. And that's because I'm often counting several different things at a time and I want to be able to remember what's what in the morning. So I'll label these as tomatoes and I'll leave them for a good few hours or even overnight. After the cooling period, I will take off the bands and I will make sure that every lid has sucked down tightly onto the jar and that the glue, which is kind of thermal setting glue, has glued it firmly in place. That's our technique for preserving a glut of tomatoes. There's one thing I would say to you, if you're going to grow tomatoes in order to preserve them, because you like cooking with tomatoes as we do, grow the right types. We like Roma and San Mazzano. And the reason is the amount of flesh underneath the skin is very different than a salad tomato. In a salad tomato, you get a thin wall of flesh and a lot of that sort of gooey, seedy material inside that. In a good quality cooking tomato, you get a lot of the flesh and that's what you want for making brilliant pasta sauces, chilies, etc. The other thing with them is the varieties we grow, you can seed save them, you can propagate them the following year and that all contributes to that self-reliance money saving aspect of it. If you've enjoyed today's content, can you spare us five seconds? Give us a thumbs up down below. If you'd like to see more on food preserving, please let us know in the comments what particular topics you'd like us to cover. and We'll try and cover those videos for you. If you want to see those videos and everything else we produce on homesteading, self-reliant living, just tap on the subscribe button down there if you haven't already. It's completely free. Tap on the bell next to it. You'll hear every time we upload a new video. But for today, thanks for watching. Come back and see us soon. Take care.